it's true that I was taught as a graduate student and 30 years since that you tailor the kind of immune response you make to the pathogen that you're fighting. So you make a particular kind of antibody called IgE if you're fighting worms, and you make killer cells if you're fighting viruses. I don't think that's true anymore. Um, I think that you tailor the kind of immune response you make to the tissue in which that immune response is happening. So if you have a response in the gut, you make a particular kind of antibody called IgA, which is secreted at mucosal surfaces. Um, IgA goes into saliva, it goes into milk, it comes out in the gut. If you have a gut response, you want IgA. It doesn't really matter whether you're fighting rotavirus in the gut or a bacterium in the gut or a worm in the gut. What you want is IgA. So, all right, the question was, how do you control the class of immunity and is it controlled by the kind of pathogen you're fighting? And no, I think you control the class of immunity based on the tissue it's happening in. And I think it's the tissue which is telling the immune system what kind of response to make. So I'll give you some, an example. There are sites in the body called privileged sites. And there are sites that immunologists for many, many years thought mm, the immune system couldn't get to. So for example, the eye. You don't want a lot of red blood cells, white blood cells, and so on in the eye because you've got to be able to see through it. So why was it called a privileged site? A privileged site is a place where you can do a transplant and it's not rejected. So if you transplant a piece of a heart mm, under my kidney capsule or under my skin or lots of other places, it gets rejected if it's from somebody else. But if you put it in the eye, it doesn't get rejected. If you put it in the brain, it doesn't get rejected. If you put it in the testes, it doesn't get rejected. And then there's one more place. The hamster cheek pouch doesn't get rejected. So when I was a graduate student, I had terrible trouble with this. Okay, you don't want immunity in the eye because you've got to see through it. But why don't you want immunity in the brain? So remember that was still when I believed in the self-non-self -self model that you learn self early and anything that appears later is considered foreign. So I thought, well, maybe long-term memory, this kind, you know, not the immunological kind, but we have to remember where your address is. Um, maybe long-term memory requires the synthesis of brand new proteins. And since they're brand new proteins, they would be considered foreign and the immune system would reject them. And so you can't let your immune system into the brain. Okay, that deals with the eye and the brain. Now what about the testes? Okay, so I thought, well, maybe there's postmeiotic expression of genes that aren't there before, and this isn't a problem for ovaries because all the eggs are made by the time a female is born, but it's a problem for testes because you don't start making sperm until you're a late teenager. So your immune system would see these as foreign and kill them. But the hamster cheek pouch? You know, this is not a sterile area. They stuff nuts and thorns and dirt and all kinds of stuff in there. Anyway, to make a long story short, I no longer believe this. And I think I'm amazed that I believed it for so long because it's an evolutionarily, unbelievably stupid idea. Imagine you have a tissue which is wet, warm, and full of nutrients and not immunologically protectable. Don't you think the pathogens would have figured it out pretty quick? And it's not true. It turns out that the eye doesn't reject a transplant, not because there's no immunity there, but because the kind of immunity that would reject a transplant would also destroy the eye. So the kind of immune response that rejects a transplant is called delayed type hypersensitivity. It's the immune response to poison ivy, right? You get some poison ivy, 48 hours later you got a blister, right? It's not like allergy, which happens immediately. So delay type hypersensitivity is basically the agent orange of the immune system. It's 
all the nasty things the immune system can do. It's killer cells that kill tissues. It's activated macrophages that, that release free oxygen radicals. It's complement-fixing antibody. It's natural killer cells that kill things. It's the secretion of interferon gamma and tumor necrosis factor. It destroys tissue. So it's useful because in destroying a local tissue, you also destroy the infection that's in that tissue. But there's some tissues that can't deal with this. And the eye, for example, is one of them. If you do a DTH response in the eye, it wipes out the eye. So the eye, the cells that line the anterior chamber of the eye, secrete molecules that tell the immune system, don't do that here. Make IgA, don't do a DTH here. And so you put a transplant in the eye, and the eye tells the immune system, yes, you need to make an immune response because you did some damage in the process of doing the transplant and all that. So you get an immune response, but the immune response you get is the immune response the eye dictates, which is IgA. So the gut does that, the eye does that. I'm beginning to think that each tissue does that. The immune system is much too dangerous to just give it free reign to kill off anything in a tissue. So I no longer think it's the pathogen which dictates the immune response. It's the tissue. And I don't know yet how each tissue does it. Give me another 20 years and maybe I'll know something. When people do something to an animal where they would normally get an immune response, like they vaccinate it, um, and they've done something to that animal before and now they don't get the immune response they would normally get from the vaccine, they call it tolerance. I'll give you an example. You can get um, a mimic of multiple sclerosis in mice by injecting them with myelin basic protein, which is a protein from neurons, from nerves, um, mixed in mineral oil and mycobacteria as a vaccine. And if you add pertussis toxin, I mean, you have to do a lot of nasty things to this mouse. But if you do this stuff to the mouse, you will get an immune response that attacks the brain, and it looks like multiple sclerosis. If, before you immunize the mouse to myelin basic protein, you feed it for 10 days with myelin basic protein, now you can immunize them and you won't get that disease. Right? That's called oral tolerance. Now, when I first heard Howard Weiner talk about oral tolerance after he talked, I went up to him at this meeting and said, Howard, you and I are both old enough to remember being immunized to polio on a sugar cube. Now, that's called oral vaccination. What's the difference? And he said, uh, well, mm, one's a virus. And I said, not good enough. And I happened to have a brand new postdoc in my lab whose name was Oral. And so I asked him if he wanted to work on oral tolerance. And he said yes. And so we went to look at oral tolerance. And it turns out that oral tolerance and oral vaccination are exactly the same. They're just measured differently. And because they're measured differently, people call it by different names. So what do I mean by that? You vaccinate somebody to polio by putting the virus on a sugar cube and feeding it to them. Right? You measure the efficacy of that vaccine by the fact that they don't get polio. Right? So it's measured by protection against polio. It turns out that polio is an oral infection, and so the IgA response is a very good protective response against polio. Right? And the IgA response is what you get when you feed something and it's the immune response from the gut. Okay. So that's called immunization because it's measured as protection against polio. Now, you feed myelin basic protein. And remember what I said about the eye? The eye pushes an IgA response. The gut does too. So you feed myelin basic protein. You get an immune response in the gut that's IgA. Now when you vaccinate you've got an immune system which already has a memory response that says make IgA. But you don't measure the IgA. 
Very few people take mouse feces and put them in a 15 mil centrifuge tube and shake it up and look at the supernatant for IgA. Right? What they're measuring is a DTH response in the brain. But they don't get a DTH response in the brain. They're getting IgA in the shit. So they're not measuring that. So they call it tolerance. Right? Because what they're measuring is one response and what they're getting is another. And so what I am arguing is that, well, actually, my lab and everybody else's lab on the planet is guilty of the same thing, which is that we have a set of assays we tend to use and a set of assays we don't tend to use. And we do something to an animal, like feed it, and by the assays we're using, we see that there's no response. So we call it tolerance. And we don't notice that behind our back, in an assay we're not using, there's an immune response coming up. It's not tolerance. It's a change in the class of immunity. In a way, the change in class is a form of tolerance. So there are two sides to immunological tolerance. One is you have to be able to deal with autoreactive cells. You have to be able to deal with cells that lymphocytes, white blood cells, that are made that can react against your own tissues. That's the classic tolerance that most people think about because much of autoimmune diseases, many of autoimmune diseases, um, are caused by cells that instead of reacting against a dangerous pathogen are reacting against self. So you can destroy yourself by having an immune response against yourself. But that's not the only form of tolerance you need to deal with. You can also destroy yourself by having an immune reaction to something dangerous and foreign, not autoimmune at all, simply by having the wrong class of immunity. So I let's go back to the eye again. Um, you can destroy the eye with a DTH response. So for example, if you get a herpes infection in the eye, it's such an overwhelming infection that the immune system will eventually make a DTH response. You clear the herpes but you also destroy the eye. So dealing with making the right class of immune response is also a form of tolerance. It's not the tolerance most people think about. Um, but it's important. It's, I wish we had a different word for it. I call it class regulation. Um, but it is a form of tolerance in that the function of switching the class is to make sure that when you make an immune response, you don't destroy yourself in the process. In the gut, or a worm in the gut, what you want is IgA. So, all right, the question was, how do you control the class of immunity and... Is it controlled by the kind of pathogen you're fighting? And no, I think you control the class of immunity based on the tissue it's happening in. And I learn the kind of immune response you make to the pathogen that you're fighting. So you make a particular kind of antibody called IgE if you're fighting worms, and you make killer cells if you're fighting viruses. I don't think that's true anymore. Um... I think that you tailor the kind of immune response you make to the tissue in which that immune response is happening. So if you have a response in the gut, you make a particular kind of antibody called IgA, which is secreted at mucosal surfaces. Um, IgA goes into saliva, it goes into milk, it comes out in the gut. If you have a gut response, you want IgA. It doesn't really matter whether you're fighting rotavirus in the gut or a bacterium. I think it's the tissue which is telling the immune system what kind of response to make. So I'll give you some, an example. There are sites 
in the body called privileged sites. And they're sites that immunologists for many, many years thought mm, the immune system couldn't get to. So, for example, the eye. You don't want a lot of red blood cells. It's true that I was taught as a graduate student and 30 years since that you take